Welcome to the fourth annual Iowa Ideas Conference. I'm Jennifer Daly, President and CEO of ICR Iowa, our region's economic development organization and the proud host of Inclusive ICR. Inclusive ICR is a coalition of over 114 members representing 57 employers from throughout the Iowa City Cedar Rapids region. Our goal is to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in our regional workforce. We are so excited to be hosting and sponsoring 11 sessions during this year's Iowa Ideas Conference. We hope you enjoy the conversations, make new connections, and walk away with some really big ideas. So now I'm happy to introduce Allison Gowans, who will be the moderator for this session. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm so glad everyone is here. We are talking about food insecurity in Iowa today. Um, and we're gonna be talking a lot about, um, you know, the pandemic's effect on food insecurity and how that impacts Iowans. Um, we have three panelists who uh, were grateful to have joined us here today. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Uh, Michelle, do you wanna start? Yeah, I would, I would love to start, thank you. My name's Michelle Book, I'm the CEO for the Food Bank of Iowa. Uh, the Food Bank of Iowa is a Feeding America food bank. There are 200 Feeding America food banks across the United States <coughs> and right in the state of Iowa, there are six of us, uh, six Feeding America food banks, Feeding America uh, food banks that all work together to make sure that no Iowan goes hungry and uh, Food Bank of Iowa is one of those six food banks. Mm -hmm. um, Deanne? I'm Deanne Cook. I'm Executive Director of United Ways of Iowa. There are around 20 United Ways that serve Iowans in their specific communities. So United Ways of Iowa exists to do the things they can do together, which are mainly public policy, training and networking, and um, statewide projects like our Alice Report. Um, what's, what's the Alice Report? The Alice Report is a report that looks at the portion of the Iowa population that are, live above federal poverty level, but can't meet a basic needs budget in the community in which they live. So it's those folks who are working, earning, paying taxes, but are still struggling every single day, every week, every month to meet their basic financial needs. Got it. Thanks. Um, Haley? Yeah, I'm Haley Boudreaux. I work for the Iowa Department of Public Health within the SNAP-Ed program. Um, this is different than the SNAP program. So we do the nutrition and physical activity um, education programs throughout the state for low-income adults and children. Um, the program I manage is Fresh Conversations, which is a nutrition education program for older adults. And then we also do programs um, like Pick a Better Snack, the School Grant Program, Farm to School, and 5 to 0. Great. Well, we are going to just get started with some questions. And to sort of set things up, I wonder um, if you guys can tell us what you've seen um, as far as what food insecurity looked like in Iowa before the pandemic and what you've seen since, since all of this started. And I'll open that up to anyone who wants to jump in. Well, I, I'd be happy to lay some context from the ALICE report. Um, our most recent ALICE report was from 2018, so pre-pandemic. And at that point, we knew there were about 37% of Iowa households who live below the survival line. So about 12% of those uh, live below the federal poverty level. But then an additional 25% were in that ALICE population where they have income, they have jobs, and they are still struggling to meet their basic needs. And the fundamental reason for that is the cost of all the items in a basic budget, which is food, transportation, healthcare, childcare, housing. Those are the basics. The, the, the um, price of all of those things has increased while wages have not kept pace. So that's the underlying reason that people were struggling going into the pandemic. And so it's not like we've seen new problems since the pandemic. It's just taken those problems deeper into the population. 
I'll jump mm -hmm. in if I may and um, right off of Deanne's comments. Uh, we at Food Bank of Iowa have seen, and other food banks across the state of Iowa have seen a dramatic increase. Uh, food Bank of Iowa, we, we're distributing now 35% more food each month than we were pre-pandemic. Across the state of, the, of Iowa, I think it's a, an average of about 28%. But Feeding America and McKinsey Consulting both have done studies um, jointly recently that indicate that food insecurity is double uh, for folks that were food insecure, it's double today, triple for households with children. And the Northwestern University Institute for Policy Research um, dove into the state of Iowa data using census data, pulse data, and our food insecurity today is 2.73 times more than what it was in February of 2020. That's just for the state of Iowa, 2.73 times more today. Um, do, oh, go ahead, Haley. I was just going to add some um, information about SNAP recipients. So nationwide, um, more than 6 million new people have enrolled in SNAP in the, just the first uh, three months of the pandemic. And then here in Iowa, um, in April, it was up 11% from the year before and 6% in May. Um, it's since fallen a little bit, but it's still definitely high. Um, and DHS also reported that um, there was an 86% increase compared to the same time last year in SNAP recipients. Um, Deanne, you mentioned the, you know, the federal poverty line versus the line you guys mark with the ALICE report. I wonder if you know or you can tell us um, what, like, what those lines are. What does that mean for like, a family? How much uh, income do they need to have to meet those two different guidelines? Sure. So when, when you don't work in the space that uh, Michelle and Haley and I work in, um, you assume that federal poverty tells you something, that that level is meaningful in some way. And what you need to know about how the federal poverty level was set was that it was in the 1960s, a federal um, economist named Molly Orshansky uh, was tasked with figuring out who lives below who lives in poverty. So her methodology was to take a family's food budget and triple it, that's federal poverty. That remains the methodology for how we figure federal poverty level to this day. So we now know that food is like the lowest budget item, way behind transportation and, and housing and childcare for families in 2020. So the point of that little anecdote is that the federal poverty measure is way out of date and has not kept pace with the way our economy has changed. Um, so federal poverty level for a family of four is about $24,000. So if you reflect on your own personal budget and think about $24,000, that's federal poverty level. What it really takes to survive in Iowa is about double that, around 50,000 for that same family. Mm -hmm. That really illustrates how um, complicated of a topic this is when it comes to, you know, working with, um, you know, the government programs and nonprofits and uh, individuals together trying to make everything work. Um, we had a, a question come through just now. Can someone uh, tell us what the acronym ALICE stands for? Sure, it's Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. So it's, it's a good way to put a face on the folks that we're talking about today. Um, so you can talk about Alice's kids, Alice's job, Alice's housing. So you can actually make it a person in your head. And, and instead of thinking about the stereotypes, really be talking about the people. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Deanne, when we uh, all talked a little bit before this panel started, you mentioned the calls to the 211 line. Can you talk a little bit about that and how those have increased? Sure, Iowa 211 um, started taking calls at the beginning of the pandemic on March 8th. Um, and so the vast, and the, the vast majority have been related to healthcare. Um, but in that time, there have been over 4,000 calls specifically related to questions to, for, uh, around food insecurity. So just for comparison, that's more than double the same time last year. So more than double the people have been calling 211 since March 8th, mainly looking for food pantries 
or health in paying for food, which would line up with some of the statistics Michelle talked about, about it being more than double. Yeah. Amy, I might jump in here for a moment, if I may. We're talking about today's food insecurity being extraordinarily increased from what it was a few months ago. But in studying past recessions, the last two recessions, um, Feeding America has reported to us that we don't expect the food insecurity need to peak until 2024. And we don't expect it to recede to pre-recession levels until 2027. So this is certainly a significant problem today, but it continues to grow and it will continue to grow for several years. So obviously the problem is pretty well established. Um, I wonder how your different organizations are, are reacting to this. Well, I would say across the food bank network and uh, the six food, Feeding America food banks that serve Iowa, we work with over a thousand partner agencies. So schools, food pantries, halfway houses, home, homeless shelters, daycares, adult daycares, um, to provide food that they will turn into a congregate meal or that they'll distribute. Um, we've had to change our distribution method to make sure everyone main, maintains safety and safe distances within COVID. So many of our distributions now are pre-packed boxes. Uh, we're looking forward to January, February. How do we get food into the trunks and vehicles and, and stomachs of hungry Iowans given um, the intense weather that's likely to come? Um, we've also seen an increase in food prices and we've seen a, a delay in food delivery, sometimes quadruple. Food that would, we would normally receive in three weeks is now taking 12 weeks. Um, and we've seen increases in prices like canned green beans, 37 cents per can before COVID, uh, 77 cents per can now, 108% increase. Canned peaches, 79 cents before COVID. 89 cents today, a 13% increase, and canned tuna, 49 cents before COVID, and 74 cents today, about a 51% increase. So we're seeing more people, um, more stress because we can't deliver food in the way we did before, uh, stress on our distribution, our trucking, and our order pulling, but then also um, the um, the uh, delivery systems and um, the supply chain issues that have come up for many of us. So, so how do you um, start to address some of those, those challenges, those issues? Like, uh, are you just applying for more, hoping for more funding from donors, from grants, from, or are you just trying to make things stretch farther? How does, how does that work for the Food Bank of Iowa? Uh, yes, to all of the above. And I would say all of the Feeding America food banks were in this together. Um, the government, uh, state of Iowa, has a Feeding Iowa task force that they put together. Um, and Lieutenant Governor um, Adam um, Greg serves on that. Adam Greg serves on that. And they've been very supportive. So we've gotten CARES Act funding through the state of Iowa. Um, fund donors have been generous. Um, we are able to meet our costs at this point in time. But again, uh, food insecurity won't peak in 2024. So this is a long haul for us. Um, I've, I, would, I would say we've never been more nimble. Um, we are thinking daily about how do we change directions? How do we do things more efficiently? Uh, for example, uh, Des Moines Public Schools, uh, we pulled the pantries out of the schools and put them in neighborhoods. Uh, because we weren't sure if schools were going to be open or stay open. And we think there are about 5,000 families just in the Des Moines Metro, in Des Moines Metro School District that need assistance. So how can we get that food to them or give them access to that food more efficiently and safely? Uh, so every day we're thinking about how do we do something new, different collaborations, new collaborations um, have popped up everywhere as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, would those be the collaborations like with the school district district we're talking about? What other kind of collaborations are you seeing? Well, one of the most unique and one I'm most um, proud of, uh, Food Bank of Iowa uh, immediately started to receive food donations from large institutional providers. So food that would have gone into restaurants 
or cafeterias um, had no home in March, April, and May. And we've also gotten a significant increase in the amount of food that comes to us from the USDA Commodity Foods Program. So using that food, we partnered with a local um, restaurant tour, Paul Rottenberg with Orchestrate. Um, he had dormant facilities and employees that weren't working. So uh, their employees are ordering food from our inventory. Uh, they curated meals, um, very, using in ju very uh, creative meal creation, uh, packaged those in single serve. Um, they were hot meals and we distributed those meals um, May through the end of September at four local health and human services organizations, curbside, uh, Urban Dreams, St. Vincent de Paul, Catholic Parities, and New Hope, uh, New Life Center, um, handed out food to people driving through on their cars, good, hot, freshly prepared, meals um, using our inventory, um, a local, um, a, a local uh, restaurant tour and his resources, and our health and human services folks and passing them out to their clients and their neighborhoods. Well, I imagine when you can get food locally like that um, from a local restaurant, that's also helping the economy more generally um, because you're helping that business person whose businesses are maybe suffering as well during this pandemic. Yeah, the ripple effect, um, thing like that is significant. And, and Haley knows that with SNAP dollars, that the ripple effect into the economy is significant. Yeah, you're correct. Um, okay. So, Deanne, you're with the United Ways, and you're talking about, you know, the 211 calls. So, you guys get calls for all sorts of different things to that, that line. Yeah. Right. It's it's basically the 911 of human services. So anytime um, if folks have a question about food or utility assistance or finding rent assistance or um, there was a lot of COVID calls, um, both how to access healthcare and questions in, in general about COVID as we were all learning about it. So um, I think the last I looked, our 211 calls year over year were up 300 percent since wow. COVID started. Well, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how food insecurity is not a, an issue that exists on its own. You know, people are obviously calling with all kinds of different concerns. Um, and, can you talk yeah. about how, it, how it, that one issue is connected to all the other um, challenges families might be facing? It's, it is interconnected um, because for a lot of reasons, um, Food is tends to be the place where people um, flex their budget. So if you don't have enough money to meet your budget this month, you're going to start to prioritize and you're going to, you know, your place to live. If you have a job, you need to prioritize your car or your vehicle. Um, if you have children in childcare, you need to prioritize that. Food is the place that people can be flexible. So it's sort of, it's, foundational. It's the one thing we have to have every day, but it's the place where people cut the most corners because it's where they can. Um, so that's when they look for food pantries, when they look to SNAP if they qualify, um, when the, that's where they need help. But what, what, the way it affects the rest of the community, the way it affects employers is if you aren't sure how you're going to feed your kids today, that is in the back of your mind all the time. You are not 100% productive. You are not able to give your all in any other way because that's a constant, constant worry. So it it's really underlays all the other challenges uh, for families that don't have sufficient income. Amy, back in November of 2019, uh, there's a banking survey done every year and that banking survey, the results were and this is November 2019, that 85% um, of Americans have less than $1,000 um, of savings. And of that number, 65% could not meet um, the expense of a small emergency like a flat tire. So we were precariously perched before COVID hit. And today, with so many of our frontline essential workers losing jobs, losing hours, People who were just on the verge of poverty have been pushed further into poverty. And I'll give an example of a story of a, a woman I know personally 
who um, she lost her husband um, about a year ago in June of a heart attack. He was just short of his 30th birthday. Um, she has four children and she works in daycare. Well, when her kids, she couldn't get um, school supported daycare and her kids aren't going to school. Um, she's got to be home with her children right now. So the money she made at her local community daycare job, um, she can only work 16 hours a week right now because that's when her kids are in school and when she has care for her kids and guidance. So, so many women are dropping out of the workforce right now because they've got to take care of their children. And again, that's half of the income for some families and sometimes more than half of the income uh, because childcare has become an issue. And then I just want to add on to, um, you know, the impact of food insecurity and stress also leads to um, diet related chronic diseases, which created, creates even more issues with healthcare. Um, and then also missing school, there was just a huge um, impact of the ripple down effect that we're talking about for families. Um, and one thing, you know, I think that we get a lot is well, how can I make a difference if I'm not food insecure? I don't know anybody with food insecurity. Um, and, and one thing um, that anyone can look up is Healthy People 2030. Some people might have heard of Healthy People 2020. Um, and this is really addressing the social determinants of health. And that's not just food insecurity, that's the economic um, impact of food insecurity, that's education, that's healthcare. Um, and, there are other ways that people can address food insecurity, either in their priority populations or priority topics at their work and at home too. You have some examples of some of the ways people can, can address that? Sure. Um, a lot of the work that we do is with PSC work, so policy, system, and environmental changes. Um, and so when we think of policies, we instantly think of um, legislature and law, but it's really ordinances, mandates, or other regulations. Um, and this can be on the local and workplace level. Um, so examples would be like local zoning or ordinances for increased green spaces or for farmers markets to be in the middle of town. Um, it could be schools that have um, vending machines and making them only healthy. Um, but it can also be something like how many bags are you able to bring onto a public bus? So if you go and get food, how many bags are you allowed to bring on the bus? Um, which is a problem in some cities. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we think of systems, these are really the processes or procedures and they often go hand in hand with the policies. Um, so this might be like a farm to school program or um, starting in a community and creating um, a community plan with the health focus, but it's also um, our hospitals screening people for food insecurity when they come in. Um, and then when we think of environment, this is often uh, maybe the most practical thing that people think about. It's usually physical changes, so um, structural or um, even programming. And so this can be um, creating safer paths for pedestrians to walk to grocery stores, um, but it's also changing prices. So are the lower, um, you know, lower nutrient value foods uh, cheaper than the healthy foods, um, but also thinking about do we have access to fast food more readily available than healthy foods. Um, so I think those are all things that people can think about when they think about food insecurity, how policy system and environmental changes around them every day impact food insecurity. What, what was that website again that you said people could go to? And I wonder, um, Amy, our room host, if, you, if that's something we can share with, with the guests that are watching on Whova. Sure, it's Healthy People 2020. Um, and really, they set out to address the social determinants of health. And there's, um, there's five domains within the social determinants of health, um, neighborhood and built environment, health and healthcare, social and community context, education, and then economic stability. And that's where um, food insecurity falls. Allison, I would add, if people want to um, help more directly, um, and uh, within the, within the uh, food insecurity distribution world to um, contact their food bank. 
Uh, there, again, there are six food banks across the state of Iowa that work to make sure all Iowans um, have what they need to live healthy lives. But there are food pantries um, supported by those food banks in every community in each one of the 99 counties. So um, reach out um, and find your local food bank, find your local food pantries in your community. Um, and I would suggest also that um, if you have time, volunteer your time. Uh, we need more volunteers today than um, ever before because we're pre-packing a lot of our distributions and donate. Um, I know $1 donated to the Food Bank of Iowa um, can provide up to four meals doing, due to our purchasing power and our food donation partnerships. So um, there are ways to get involved um, at the granular level as well. And I just tagging on to what Michelle said, I think that's a, a learning that a lot of folks who don't work in this space, um, it, it's a realization for them. It's great if you clean out your pantry and bring a box of canned goods to the food pantry, but they can make your dollars go farther. So all donations are good donations, but know that when they use their purchasing power, they can make your dollar go farther than they can make your four cans of food go. And that's just a realization that people who don't work in this space don't know. When we purchase food, we purchase it by the truckload. And of course, look for discount food providers when we do that. Michelle, can you tell us the difference between a food pantry and a food bank? Alice, I'm so glad you asked. Um, a food bank is a large distribution center. And the role of a food bank is to find free and reduced cost food, keep it safe. We had to meet the same food safety requirements as any restaurant or grocery store, and then distribute it, get it out the door as quickly as possible to our partner agencies. Food pantries get their food from food banks. Uh, not 100% of it, but a majority of a food pantry's food comes from a food bank. Um, they also have people dropping off donations and they also have um, people that are, are um, giving them food um, in addition to money. But for the most part, um, we work with the small um, community food pantry. It might be located in a church, it might be located in a school or a community center. And we help them build capacity. We train them. Um, we audit them um, to make sure that they're complying with all of our standards. So when you get food from a Feeding America food bank pantry, uh, you know that you're getting it and the food is safe to consume, uh, regardless of what the can might be dated, um, but it's safe to consume and it's delivered with dignity. Um, and I believe the um, food bank in the Cedar Rapids area is HACAP. Is that that's correct? Um, HACAP is more in the Iowa City area. No, it's here in Cedar North Rapids. Cedar Rapids, and then the yeah. Northeast Iowa Food Bank is in Waterloo. Uh, yes. River Bend is in the Quad Cities. Uh, food Bank of the Heartland is in Omaha and serves the western side. And then there's Food Bank of Siouxland up in the northwest corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to, to correct you, but uh, I've, no, been okay. the, I've been to the Haycap Food Pantry. It's just, I think it's like in Hiawatha, actually. So just north yes, of here. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, people can... I know we have people watching, you guys are all based in Des Moines, we have people watching from across the state, but for any of our local uh, participants in the session, our local um, food bank is, is HACAP, and I know that they're always looking for volunteers, and um, they fund a lot of the pantries here in Cedar Rapids, or not fund, but they it's get food. Very, to the it's a very well-run organization, very efficient. Um, they were really hit hard with the derecho um, and just performed extraordinarily well with the community, within the community. So I encourage you to reach out um, to them and your local pantries to see how you can support them. Mm -hmm. um, Deanne, with, with United Way and the 2-on-1 lines, this is um, related to that. Uh, what Michelle just brought up about the derecho. I wonder if food insecurity, if you saw an increase here in, in our area in Lynn County and Tama County, you know, some of the other counties that were impacted um, with calls after, after the derecho. 
Yes, the calls about tripled in the two or three weeks after, and, and that's overall across all types of challenges. So I didn't drill down into food, but the call volume went up about three times year over year in the, in the last part of August. Um, and what we saw a lot in that case, people had done the right thing. They had stocked up during the pandemic. They were reducing their trips to the grocery store. They were keeping more food at home. And then when they lost power for two plus weeks, that created um, a different food insecurity and maybe affected other people who had been kind of, kind of skating on the edge and were making it work. And then that threw them to the other side to lose a month's worth of food. Um, so that's been a significant challenge that we've seen in Eastern Iowa. Well, in our pantries, the pantries as well, uh, the folks that had stocked up to serve these clients also lost refrigeration and freezing and lost their food. So, uh, hey, Cap, I know in others, we had many in our geographic area as well that we had to restock and that was unexpected. You know, when, when we have a year when we're seeing um, sort of crisis after crisis, whether it's the pandemic, it's, you know, economic recession, people losing their jobs, which is obviously related to the pandemic, um, something like the derecho. Are, are there things we can do to make our food systems more resilient? What's been interesting is that our, we have two separate food systems in the United States, one where it's institutional restaurant destined food and the other food destined to grocery stores. And what I found in March and April is that these two systems don't pivot very well. So we had an excess of food within the institutional restaurant food chain and a lack of food in the grocery store chain. One does not move well. Um, you've got a 20 gallon bladder of eggs um, destined for a restaurant. You can't convert that into grocery store use. So there's some opportunities I think for the food in industry to think about how they can weather these kinds of changes more efficiently and more effectively. But also we have two separate food distribution systems for consumers in the United States. One is the local grocery store and the farmer's market for you and me. Um, the other is food pantries for people that can't afford to go to the grocery store. And uh, my dream is that someday everybody can go to the grocery store to get the food they need to take care of their families. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about, that's about like, you know, the big, um, sort of structural, structural things about how our food system works. Um, are there, are there things that you guys are looking at as potential solutions, um, um, on a, a more, you know, regional or local level? I wouldn't say, go ahead, Deanne. United Ways work in three main areas, um, education, financial stability, and health. Um, and we know those are all tied together. So part of our work on education is we know that leads to financial stability. And ultimately that's where we need to be. So we don't have nearly 40% of Iowa's households who can't meet a basic needs budget. Um, they need to have the education and the job opportunities to earn that sort of a wage that gets them above surviving and scrapping for every single thing every day, every week, every month. Um, so we try to work on it holistically um, and, and be that convener and that supporter of all types of policies and programs that are lifting the entire boat. Thank you, Deanne. And I'm a huge proponent of United Way, uh, because if we don't address those issues, poverty continues, food insecurity continues. The Congressional Budget Office um, reported that income inequality in the U.S. increased 20 percent between 1980 and 2016, and that gap's only widening now with COVID. Um, if we don't address that, um, people will continue to be hungry. The people we serve, for the most part, they're senior citizens on fixed income, they have mental or physical disabilities, and they're the people working hard to make ends meet. Most of the people we serve, they have a roof over their head, and they have jobs. 
but on with minimum wage again another problem at seven and a quarter um, people aren't making enough money today in order to feed their families and there have been technological advances that have driven this gap globalization decline of unions but really the erosion of minimum wage has been a huge contributor to income inequality and food insecurity yeah, and I just want to give a little background about qualifying for SNAP or food assistance. So um, the threshold is 130% of the federal poverty line. I think one of you have said that before, but that equates to $28,000 per year for three people. Um, and really the average household um, only, uh, the average household of a SNAP recipient only has an income of $10,000 a year. And those people receive $239 a month to spend on food for three people. Um, so it, it is really, really low. And like Michelle said, most of these people do have jobs, they are working. Um, and that means that they don't get the max benefits. Um, and so one thing that ha has happened with the pandemic is uh, with the CARES Act is the SNAP benefits have been able to be expanded and people have been able to receive the max benefits, but those people that were already receiving the max benefits, they didn't get any more money. Um, the other thing to think about is uh, we there's gonna be a report coming out um, with older adults actually, and there were a lot of interviews done with um, how the pandemic affected um, getting food from the grocery store, from food banks, from food pantries. And really a lot of them highlighted how beneficial the expansion of food, um, of SNAP was for them. They were able to purchase foods that they had never gotten before. Um, and so I just want to put that in people's minds and realize um, how little money people are bringing in and how beneficial SNAP is for people. And again, this is this is meant to cover a large portion of their food budget, but it's not meant to cover all of it, unfortunately. Haley, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the idea that it's not just about access to any food to just getting you know, a certain number of calories per day, but like healthy food and food deserts and those kinds of things and how SNAP might help with that. Sure. Um, so again, like I said, SNAP unfortunately doesn't cover a whole food budget, especially if you're working. It's not meant to cover that. Um, and the problem is uh, a lot of families SNAP benefits run out towards the end of the month. And at that point, it comes to whatever they have access to. And when we look at um, lower income uh you know, communities or, you know, pocket neighborhoods in, in a big city. Um, there was my dog, I'm sorry. Um, you know, those, the quickest access, the things that they can access are fast food um, or things that provide fullness, but not um, correct nu nutrient quality, if that makes sense. Um, and so we see a problem with mal malnourishment and when we think of being malnourished we also we often think of um you know in other countries you might see stunting or wasting of children but really in the united states a version of malnourishment is obesity and that's um what is leading to these chronic diseases diabetes high blood pressure heart disease um, and that's often happening in low income people and then creating, again, this cycle that we've already kind of talked about. Well, and then when you have a pandemic that um, is a more serious, often, not always, but often a more serious illness for people with some of those chronic health problems, you can sort of see how everything is connected in, in even more ways, I guess. Yeah, and the other thing um, that has happened with this pandemic is people have been able to use their SNAP benefits online and to have food delivered to them. But I work a lot with older adults. That is a whole other thing to have to navigate and think about and learn to do. And I think the pandemic has um, really widened some of these disparities and things that we talk about because it just adds more barriers for them. It might seem like a good idea, but that is one more stressor in their life to have to figure out and learn how to do. 
Um, that makes me wonder about things like accessing benefits um, and accessibility of these different programs, you know, getting to a food pantry, knowing how to fill out the forms for SNAP. Um, even some, some food pantries have requirements, you know, you have to meet a certain income level or can only come a certain number of times a month. I wonder if any of you guys can talk about sort of accessibility concerns and, and ways people can work to address those. I can do just a bit of context. The other two are the experts on navigation, but what I can tell you we've learned since the pandemic is that we have a lot of newly needy Iowans. So we call them newly needy because they have been able to meet a survival budget. They have been able to cover their own expenses until the pandemic. And so now they are in a panic because they have never accessed human services in any kind of way. And to your point, Allison, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough navigation to learn. So we have lots of Iowans who are now out there trying to figure this out for the very first time. And it's, it's a challenge. I would encourage anybody if they get an opportunity to go through a simulation exercise, and I've done it several times. Um, it's incredibly difficult, especially if you're challenged with transportation to um, sign up for benefits, um, to, to present yourself at a clinic that will take care of you without insurance, um, to get to a food pantry during open hours. But um, it, it's difficult for many of us to get a lot of these day-to-day -day things completed, um, but it just adds more to your plate and makes things more and more difficult. And there are rules and times and ways to complete all these things that again, uh, to Deanne's point, they're newly needy, um, have not navigated this system before. And it's certainly a system that um, you have to learn how to navigate. Yeah, and for anybody seeking a food pantry, I would say um, go to your local food bank website or go to, uh, there's an association of Iowa food banks uh, put in your zip code, uh, go to the uh, Food Bank of Iowa Association website, put in your zip code, and you'll find the pantries nearest you. And the other thing that I want to add is these food assistance programs work. There's lots of research out there that says that if, if used correctly, if accessible, they work well. And that is SNAP, that's WIC, that's the National School Lunch Program, um, and the, the list goes on. They work. But again, just like Michelle and Deanne said, they take work. You have to apply, you have to travel to them, you have to understand, and you have to plan. And so there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, the other thing to think about is just our food system in general. So, you know, a lot of places were limiting um, the hours that they were open or how many people could be on a cart. Um, so then you have to have childcare to go to the grocery store. Um, that doesn't make sense. Um, it's hard to operate. And, a, a normal person like you and me, um, we can do that. We can, we have, you know, family close by or friends that can help us, you know, take care of um, things while we, we go grocery shopping. But it's just all of these barriers that really make it hard to navigate the system. And sometimes it's just easier not to do them, if that makes sense. Um, so, if people are talking about, you know, this is the Iowa Ideas Conference, we want people to, to share their ideas and come away with ideas about what they can do to help. Um, you know, you know, we talked about like volunteering or donating or things like that. Um, but, on, you know, it seems like a, a theme I'm hearing from all of you is that if the system was a little uh, was simplified, streamlined perhaps, that might be a way that a lot of people could have better access to, to, to these programs. Um, Allison, I think number one, bottom line number one is for us to talk about food insecurity, for people to understand food insecurity and to understand income equality and for this not to be our best kept secret. So I think the number one priority, if I were suggesting what people can do talk about it, learn more, invite somebody within this network to speak at your church or your rotary or any of your other groups, but continue to talk about it, spread the word. It's closer to home than anyone might think. 
But I think the more that we destigmatize, destigmatize food insecurity, the closer we will come to solving food insecurity. Um, I guarantee you it's the person sitting next to you, um, behind you at church or on the bus or our kid at school. It's closer than you think. We need to talk about it. Um, and then I think as we talk about it and learn about it, um, we need to, to vote. We need to go to the polls. Um, it's that time of year and um, elect people that will help us solve some of these very big societal issues. Mm -hmm. And I would just um, tag on a lot of the, the opportunities I have like this um, to speak to folks are really about um, getting below the stereotypes, getting beneath the stereotypes. We all have a picture in our head of who we think lives below the federal poverty level or who we think needs a food pantry. And we need to realize it's a lot more people than we think, to Michelle's point. And there are a lot of structural reasons why that occurs and stop pointing the finger at the people and start looking at the system that created the issue. Um, that's probably the biggest takeaway that I have from doing this work for several years. Yeah, and I, I just wanna bring it back to the PSE changes that I talked about. Um, so everyone here- so Remind us again what PSE stands for. Yep, policy system and environmental changes. And you don't, you don't need to do all of them. Um, but I, everyone here either uh, works someplace, lives in a community, um, does something. And you can make a change, um, either a policy, a system, or environmental change that will, in result, impact food insecurity. Um, and again, we shared that, that website to the social determinants of health, and, and they, can, they can really help. Um, I do want to um, echo the, the stigma, too. I think um, a lot of people don't think um, if they're not seeing it right before their eyes, they, it doesn't exist, exist to them. Um, and this is, a, this is a problem. It's been a problem for a very long time. Um, I think sometimes we go through periods of like discovery, so people discover food insecurity. Um, but it's been here whether you discovered it just now or not. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about too is uh, food insecurity is a, um, it's a, it's a racial issue too. So, um, you know, populations of color are disproportionately impacted of, um, with food insecurity. And, you know, in Iowa, we, we do have a high white population. And so that might not be who your neighbor is or um, the people living in your community. But I do want to bring that um, topic into this and, and think why those people are disproportionately impacted as well. Absolutely, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a very important point um, for us all to keep in mind. Um, we are encouraging questions from the audience. Um, a few came in, and I would encourage anyone watching to go ahead and add their questions in the Whova chat. And I'm going to um, ask some of those now. Some of them we've already addressed, so I'll, I'll skip over them. But um, a question we got was, what role can urban design play in addressing food insecurity? I can, I can start. Oh. Um, I would just so, say, I would I would just say transportation. Yeah, and and I agree with that. I think um, looking at it from kind of a dietitian perspective and the nutritional part of this. Um, so food um, food deserts came up, but bringing it back to food swamps um, and where people access their food and food swamps are um, impacted because there's a high concentration of unhealthy foods or fast food restaurants. Um, and, and that can happen in urban areas and it can also happen in rural areas. So we don't always um, think about urban design in rural areas, but here in Iowa, that is definitely um, something to pay attention to. And how far um, transportation, how far it is to their local um, accessible healthy foods 
Um, and one thing to also think about, it, it doesn't have to be convenience stores or fast food restaurants. It also is dollar stores. And they would be considered um, SNAP eligible stores because things like beef jerky and um, easy squeeze cheese are considered SNAP eligible. But that, that would be the only food that they would have to carry um, to accept SNAP benefits. And that, uh, you know, we talk about that with our Alice report, there's not a huge difference between urban um, counties and rural counties, just the challenges of accessing food are different. Um, so it, we can't dismiss this as an urban problem or a rural problem. It, Haley's outlined the challenges. They exist in both places. They're just different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question we got is about Okay, it says, what is the status of the food as medicine movement in Iowa wiring food and nutrition into our health systems as a human right so we can look beyond addressing hunger as charity? We are working, Food Bank of Iowa is working with a, um, two major healthcare systems in central Iowa to develop a, a program. Um, it's been slowed down somewhat with COVID. Uh, they've been distracted uh, the last few months, the last seven, eight months. Um, but we do think, and um, Haley spoke to it earlier, that there should be a prescription for food and that getting uh, available nutritious food available close to clinics um, is also a good way to best serve senior citizens um, because they do go to clinics um, as well as others across our geographic footprint. Um, but it is important to work with healthcare providers. Um, they, they, there are two very easy questions they can ask. Uh, to determine if somebody is food insecure or not, they can write a prescription and they can keep food right there on hand, um, as well as home health care workers. We're working with a network um, that home health care workers, as they go out to visit um, their clients, their patients, they'll have something in the car in the event uh, they arrive and people are short of food, in addition to providing them information uh, as to how they can find their nearest pantry. What and, does it mean to write and, a prescription for food? Pardon me? I said, what does it mean to write a prescription for food? Um, it would be that the um, healthcare provider, uh, the doctor or the nurse pr pr uh, practitioner uh, would have recognized via the screening questions uh, or perhaps um, other interrogation or questioning of their, of their patient that part of their health issue is a result of their nutrition. And, and I, I'm of the belief that you are what you eat. Uh, and so many of these illnesses and diseases are nutrition, lifestyle driven um, issues. And that the doctor would suggest to them that you need to change your nutritional habits. Here's a nearby pantry, here's a food box to help in the meantime, this is how you sign up with SNAP um, benefits. Um, that at the clinic, the healthcare practitioners would help drive people toward food accessibility. And then I just want to add, so thank you to whoever asked this question. This is exactly what my department does. And I don't know if my mom asked it. Hi, mom. Um, but, uh, thank you. Because this is SNAP Ed. Um, this is what we do. We do education programs, nutrition education programs for um, SNAP recipients. And um, so the program that I do, I do is um, Fresh Conversations, and it's a free nutrition education uh, program for older adults. Um, and you can find more information on our website, so I won't go through all our programs again. But the other thing that I want to bring up, um, it's a common misconception that um, people on SNAP and food assistance programs eat um, more unhealthy than people that are not on those programs. And... Um, there's very little difference in the amount um, of money that is spent um, across the board. So like 40% for a normal person and some or not a non-SNAP recipient versus someone on SNAP is spent on meat, fruits and vegetables, your basics, milk, eggs, bread. Um, and then 20% of that, again, both um, sides of the table are spent on sugar sweetened beverages, desserts, and salted snacks. 
Um, and so this is a conversation that we do need to have for people that are food insecure, but we also need to have a bigger conversation with everyone about how food is medicine and how beneficial healthy food is. Um, we have about five minutes left. I have one more question that I want to ask that came through on the chat, um, which is asking if you can speak more about uh, the dignity part, part of all of this. Um, the questioner says nonprofits can struggle to empower clients when the process of food distribution poses a challenge to dignity. And I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on that. We encourage our pantry partners uh, to work within that space of, of dignity when they're distributing food to clients. Um, and for that, that means um, that access is open, that you can come as often as you need to get the resources you need, um, that the questions are limited to the information that we need to take in for purposes of administrating USDA food. Uh, there are a uh, few questions that we do need to ask, um, but that people come in, they're welcomed into the, the space or the food is distributed to them curbside um, very easily, um, as often as they, not, as they need and with a, a bare minimum of the questions that need to be asked. Um, we also ask our pantries um, to not request identification um, identification is, um, it scares many people. Um, it scares our immigrant population as well, um, documented and undocumented. So those are the three, three things. Um, distribute um, as often as people need it. Um, limit your questions to only those that are necessary and um, distribute without need for identification. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to add anything to that? I know it was really hard um, because we don't do direct service, particularly I don't do direct service um, to speak to it as specifically as Michelle, but I heard a lot of pain in, in calls as, as the pandemic was starting and in working with food pantries or food um, partners and being on calls they try to make it as much of a shopping experience and put as much personal choice into the foods that are um, that that clients receive as possible. They work really hard on that. So when safety became an issue and they were just pre-boxing food and the choice went away and the making it more like a real shopping experience went away, that was truly painful. I could hear it in our food partners voices because that is such a fundamental thing for them to provide that dignity that to have to take it away even temporarily in the name of safety just pain them so much and, and I think that speaks to the way that they all approach their work. They see the dignity in their clients and they want the clients to feel that. Absolutely. Um, we just have two minutes left so I want to give you guys a chance if you have any like closing thoughts or la things we didn't uh, really get to talk about that you think you should bring up now is your chance. Okay. I would just say, uh, go, yeah, okay, go for it. <laughs> I would just say go thank you, you, Allison, and the Iowa Ideas Conference for this opportunity because I think as all three of us said in our idea portion of this, that talking about it and helping others who aren't living um, in this space day to day is critical to making the changes that are needed in the system and making the changes that are needed in society to help address the bigger problems. So thank you for creating a forum for that. I would say that if you need help or if you can help, go to the website for the Iowa Food Bank Association to find your Feeding America Food Bank. And there will be um, information there for you if you can volunteer, if you can donate, or if you need help, uh, there will be links there so you can use your zip code to find uh, pantries that are closest to you. But above and beyond all, talk about food insecurity. Um, help us destigmatize food insecurity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Allison, for hosting, and thank you to the Gazette and the Iowa Ideas Conference. It's been great, and um, there's more information about our SNAPED 
uh, programs on the Iowa Department of Public Health website. Um, thank you guys so much for all joining us. We really appreciate it and your perspectives are, are great to hear from and, and your expertise. So I really wanna thank the three of you for joining us and I really wanna thank all of our audience members for listening in. We appreciate you being here as well. Um, that's why we're doing this for all of you guys listening. So thank you all. Thank you, Allison. Bye.